All right, so we're now live. So um, we'll wait a few moments for our online viewers to see the notification to join us. But thanks so much to our in-person audience who's here with us here at the Siena Art Institute. Uh, it's wonderful to have you all with us for this evening as we have with us Richard Zeiss, who is uh, not only our speaker this evening, but is also our artist in residence uh, for, for this whole month. I guess also the it's been a little bit over a month uh, for the whole stay, so it's been really wonderful to have him here as part of our community at the Siena Art Institute. Um, so just a, a very um, brief introduction in terms of this talk is a part of an ongoing series of um, talks that we have with our resident artists um, who are, uh, again, here to pursue their own independent artistic projects, uh, but also to be in contact with our community, with our students. So it's really been a pleasure to have uh, Richard sitting in on some of our um, critiques of student projects, joining us on some museum visits. So it's really been a wonderful way for us to get to know him, for him to get to know us, and to get to know the the resources of our city as well. Um, he'll be here with us through the end of the month of March. Uh, and then for the month of April, we'll have two other resident artists who are coming from Brazil and from Iran by way of Poland, by way of the Netherlands. <laughs> so we should have uh, an interesting lineup of some guests who will be part of our programming uh, for the month of April coming up. Um, but just a few notes about our guest this evening, uh, Richard Zeiss. So he was born in Vienna, Austria, but currently lives in London, England. And he holds an MA in Fine Arts um, from CSM in London and a Master's in Philosophy in Painting from the Royal College of Art in London. But his practice is also informed by his earlier career in banking and having a Master's in Science and Finance um, from Vienna University, uh, as well as an MBA from um, I see in Barcelona, so he's a very multifaceted person. <laughs> so um, his own work he has shown um, internationally um, in solo shows such as at the George Carl Fine Arts in, in Vienna, uh, the Gallery Asbeck in Copenhagen, the Dawang Culture Highland in Shenzhen, and many uh, other uh, group exhibitions as well. Um, so that's a very brief introduction, but of course we're here to hear from the guy himself. So let me mute my microphone so then we can turn the microphone over to Richard here. So, I'll... Excellent, thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, well, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to do this in English, obviously, because I want to say things. Um, I, it's always tricky with these events because you never know how far back do you want to take your, your audience. So I decided to, I think I'm going to show like two or three works or projects um, from way back and then most of the rest will be sort of more recent. Although as you age, more recent becomes relative. Um, so I'm going to start and I'm, it's, it's, now that's as focused as it gets. Um, so I'm sorry if you can't read this. Uh, so this is this is the work I want to start with. It's really part of a series, um, and uh, I'm starting I'm starting off with this because it's sort of the first one uh, of a long line of works to date that I've um, I've worked on with uh, Egg Tempera, which is also I could tell maybe at the end if, if there is time, which is it's one of the reasons why I'm actually here. Um, but let me start with this. So um, around 2006, I started. Uh, I, I tried to. I tried to do a painting uh, on the basis of a photo that I'd taken in a in a, in a small town in Norway called Vardø. Um, somehow the, the the printer that I was trying to use to print off the photo and then paint from it wasn't having it. Uh, kept elongating the uh, the picture, and at some point I gave up and said, you know what? I'll give you some authority and I'll just paint whatever you print. And it was one of those elongated things. I decided that's what I'll do. And that then sort of painted me into a uh, into a situation really where I got really, I sort of, I looked at this and said, well, this looks like somebody's going past a building at high speed. So I started to, this kind of triggered an interest in, 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 the, in the notion of speed um, the physical phenomenon, not not the substance, uh, and and I was I was sort of 
when you think about speed, there's one philosopher that, that you'd be interested in, and that's a French guy called Paul Virilio. Uh, he's a philosopher and an architect, and he writes a lot about speed and, and internet and sort of um, immediate access through screens and also about war and uh, intelligent missiles and, 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 and similar things about how war uh, is, is being fought not in person anymore. Although nowadays, well, I don't know. Anyway, so um, the uh, that that took me to um, to the to the next series called Good Evening. This is CNN. Um, maybe I show you this one. Uh, at the time, I was I was um, sort of reading about Virilio's uh, take on on intelligent weapon systems and and war. Reminded me of the Second Gulf War. Um, and at that time, you would basically see um, live footage of, of so-called intelligent missiles um, hitting targets in, in, the, in the Middle East. Um, and that kind of sort of, that was a, a mental image that, that, that stuck with me. So that's basically what this entire series is, is based on. I, I only have, I only ever tried to put uh, like two to three of uh, of the works onto each uh, page. I don't want to sort of give you the whole shebang of, of, of the works for the series. Um, all of this is still egg tempera. Um, at some point, I I moved on from from uh, Virilio, and my I would say my work my practice got a bit more. Um, I want to say random, I suppose. Um, um, it sort of. Certain series, I would always work in series, got triggered by um, sort of uh, by external factors, by something. I would see something, I would find something interesting, and I would run with it. Um, and and a good example would be the um, uh, the work I did during a, a residency in Shenzhen in, in China um, in 2012, I want to say. Um, and so one of the works there is is um, actually the entire series. Let me put it this way: the entire series is based on on one work by a Chinese artist uh, by the name of Wang Huijing. <clears throat> the work is called "The Forgotten Garden," and I, I, I saw I came across the, the uh, picture in a in a, in a in a magazine on Asian art, and I found it fascinating. And I said, "I'm here. I'll do this." And then I, then I did uh, 19 almost identical paintings, um, and they just differ in the, in the degree to which the, um, uh, the which they're sort of exposed. Well, I was painting them, but you get the idea, sort of some are, some are lighter, some are darker. Um, and I then um, created a, uh, an, an animation based on that. And I'm going to try to show it to you. It's called Pulse. And uh, hang on, there we go. So that's 19, obviously repeatedly. Um, and this is a 60 seconds loop. I'm going to not show you all the 60 seconds, you get the idea. So, um, so that was. Um, before I, before I sort of, and yeah, that, this was still egg tempera. Um, I remember that gave me quite a bit of challenge because I, um, the climate in, in, in the southern parts of China, especially in summer, is is very humid and hot, and so my paintings would constantly go off, basically, and uh, mold. So that was uh, there's a reason why egg tempera is not overly popular in that part. Um, so. Um, at that time, I was sort of I realized, okay, I'm, I'm I'm lacking a bit of academic undercarriage here, and I decided to try to to do um, well. At the time, I tried to do a PhD, really, but then I turned into into an MPhil, which is like half a PhD because time and money. Um, and I went through that phase that I suppose every painter goes through it to some degree, the painting about painting phase. Um, and towards the end of the the, the M. Phil project, uh, something something I would say 
highly fruitful emerged that is is with is, is with me sort of to this to this to this day in terms of its ramifications um i became interested in the relationship between uh, between text and image especially um as as discussed by a belgian linguist called paul Demont. he was talking about something uh, called the, a concept called pure radical materiality of text, basically that would be the letters because they have no external reference. You, you would then compile them and assemble them into words. That would make sense. But before that, there's no, there's no relationship. And I was thinking to external factors. I was thinking, does that exist in painting, in visual arts? It's kind of a conundrum because it would mean seeing before seeing. So I tried to do it the, a, roundabout, a roundabout way. And I used, um, I decided to use materials that you wouldn't normally find in combination and with completely different sort of connotational baggage. I used egg tempera, again, like, um, um, you know, it would be, egg tempera is, is as you probably know, is, is, was very popular in medieval religious painting. You could see it not even a kilometer from here, the Pinacoteca. Nationale, and um, and I, I used I used tarpaulin, which is a very menial uh, industrial material that you see on on you know construction sites guarding other material. It's really sort of the lowest of the lowest. And my idea was that um, basically putting these together would, would completely they would sort of negate each other in terms of, of connotations, and I would end up with something altogether completely new. And so the one of the first works I did was was this. So that's egg tempera and yaw on um, tarpaulin. Um, it's rather elongated again. It's about two two or six centimeters. Um, it's about six foot nine. Um, I took that that idea of egg tempera on tarpaulin through uh, a lot of iterations all the way to um, immersive uh, installations that 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 is inside my studio and it pretty much is exactly my studio um, that is again egg tempera on top holding um, I called it the amber room like the the room that was stolen from St. Petersburg and never re-emerged um, because that's what it looked like that, the idea was to sort of create something with somewhat fake materials. Um, it was, I think it was at a time when fake news was uh, in the news a lot, as in, as a term. So I, I had this idea of creating something fake. Um, so at the time, my, my approach was generally widening in terms of mediums and, and in terms of, of conceptual approach. Um, so I would, I'm going to show you a, a bit of a curveball here. This is not even on my website. Um, so this is how intimate we are already. Uh, I, okay, so this is, not bad. So, so this is, um, I actually have to read this off because it's, it was, this was the first, this was the first work where um, sort of a, a clearly phenomenolo phenomenological angle uh, came into play. It's always bad when you, you practice about something that you have problems pronouncing. Um, it uh, it was basically I started off with with cello tape. I, I said I'm I'm going to do really long, really landscapey paintings on cello tape. I did two. Um, I did two of them. Uh, I'm going to read this now. I, I initially glued um, two three-meter strips of egg tempera on cello tape together and fed them through a 16 millimeter projector, which yielded about 20 seconds of film that is painting that has a spatial and temporal dimension. This image is the printout of a digital photo that I took of a video still that had resulted from the strip getting stuck in the projector. Um, so basically, the, what, what interested me in, in, in this work is what, what the work really is. Because so this, this is a photo, um, I made an edition of five, a printout. Um, but really, 
if the work could have been anything, it's uh, it, it it went it went from sort of a, a f slightly flawed video attempt uh, from really from the painting to a slightly flawed video attempt to an accident to photos. I thought, well, maybe I should take it into performance. I don't know. I wouldn't quite know how. But um, so this is something I found to this day I found really interesting where sort of where um, where work comes up in a in a sort of in a in a wide conceptual field that's like um, sort of like a mangrove where you know you've got the the roots of the of the trees being interconnected underneath the surface and you never know where they come up. Um, so, oh yeah, so the, um, I call this a curveball, I think I have to do another curveball, although at some point I, I, I probably realised that my curveballs really turn into my practice, it's sort of, as I said, it's sort of widened out and I, I've also become less uh, concerned with, um, what should I say, with what people think, what my what the red thread might be from my practice, because it, I really see it as a big mosaic, and you know there's sort of stones further out and stones further inside the picture, and big picture will probably just God knows. You know. um, so I'll show you the next one as an example of of sort of a slightly whimsical approach to um, how I come up with ideas maybe. Uh, so one morning, and this is what the um, what this uh, handout is, is about. It's a text, don't read it now, although you can if you can. Um, it's one morning, one morning I was, I was, I woke up and I wanted to exercise and I was, I was lazy and I thought, let me sort of soothe my conscience and find confirmation that it's okay to um, spread your exercise over, you know, through the through the day rather than do it for one hour in the morning. So I was gonna. I, I think I was going to search. Is it better to exercise once or throughout the day or something along along the lines? And this is okay. This is what came up uh, as predictive text. Is it better to? So it's uh, so the predictive text text was. Is it better to speak or die? Is it better to rent or buy? Is it better to be single? Is it better to have a water meter? Is it better to have two dogs? So that I found really interesting. Um, it sort of, it reminded me of, you probably know uh, Foucault's The Order of Things. Uh, and there is, there is a preface in the book where he, um, he writes about um, a, a text by, uh, but yes, uh, when that guy in turn writes about uh, a, an artificial language that, that an English an Englishman tried to try to create, um, and basically what comes up in this text is something called the celestial emporium of benevol benevolent knowledge in a in a Chinese text. Uh, and this is probably one of the most fascinating ways of categorizing animals that I've ever seen. So this is how they categorized animals. One, those that belong to the emperor. Two, embalmed ones. Three, those that are trained. Four, suckling pigs. Five, mermaids. Six, fabulous ones. Seven, stray dogs. Eight, those that are included in this classification. Nine, those that tremble as if they were mad. Ten, innumerable ones. Eleven, those drawn with a very fine car camel hairbrush. Twelve, etc. Thirteen, those have just those that have just broken the flower vases. And fourteen, those that at a distance resemble flies. So I said, um, what can I do with that? So the randomness of this categoriz categorization made me then decide to do something to my library. Um, I decided to, I thought, okay, how, how, is, how is a library normally 
classify it and categorize. It would probably normally be categorized by subjects. But how else could you categorize it? So I did that. I thought, let's do it by spine color and let's do it by, as I call it, by experience in social settings. So this would be the one, the experience in social settings. How much have they sort of, you know, been turned exposed to the world? Um, this one would be the by spine color, and this one would be the sort of what we consider the normal one uh, by subject. I thought that was a normal one, by, but I remember by the end of the day when I posted that, two, two friends of mine said, can you come and arrange it like this? I said, yeah, all right. I'll be there in a minute. So when, when I come up with, with ideas for, for proposals um, with, with potential hosts, like here, for example, um, or, or shows or, or, or other sort of open calls, as you call them, or even not open calls, you just have an idea that this institution could be interesting for that. Um, I try to sort of amal amalgamate my own my own way of working with with something that that sort of uh, catches my eye locally. Um, so so I in two thousand nineteen I participated at the Lagos Biennial, um, and I had uh, so the idea was I was invited to a sort of a kickoff meeting in 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 early two thousand nineteen in London. And I was invited because people said, I, I knew friends there, so, so that's why I went. I hadn't actually had the uh, intention of, of applying or submitting any material. Uh, but then the, the person presenting talked about possible locations and one one name, one location rang a bell because I'd read about real estate in Lagos uh, and horrendous sort of price differences. And, and I remember that it's called Echo City. It's in the sort of most expensive part, expensive part of town. And I, I was thinking that who can afford that? Because it's it's not like these. That there's an uh, an overly equal distribution of wealth in in Lagos. Lagos is unbelievably unbelievably divided in terms of in terms of uh, of wealth. Um, and uh, so I said. I'm going to try to come up with something very simple, but sort of also um, visually, uh, how would you call it, attracting in a in a more, in a most literal sense, sort of attracting. It sort of pulls you in because there is something to it that you want to see. So these are um, forty pieces of of, of again egg tempera on tarpaulin. Um, based on this, on the average house prices in the different areas of Lagos. Uh, so the biggest one would not surprisingly be Echo. And the smallest one is something I did. Um, so there's 40, 40 districts in there. And the 41st one is something that I calculated on my own, especially when you, there's something called the, 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 the living wage, which is slightly higher than the, um, the minimum wage. So living wage is supposed to allow you to actually live and participate in social life. Uh, so if you take the yield and, and, and rent, or the, the yield of rent and the rent, then you can calculate the house price um, bottom up. Uh, and the, the tiny little thing you might be able to, oh, okay, here. So this here, this here, this is, uh, this is the, um, the house price based on, on on, on the living wage model, and the one around it is Echo City. So you get an idea of, you know, what I was talking about there. So, yeah, and when I was in, in Lagos, I did some 16mm, uh, I shot some 16mm footage on a really old um, uh, bollocks camera, and I've since then started doing lots of films as well, um, and I'm going to show you two now because they're, sh they're short. So the first one is something I developed at home uh, that had transferred to digital and then uh, edited in digital because everything else would be an enormous pain in the behind. So here we go.
It's traces of the Independence House in Lagos. So, um, yeah, I, as I said, I developed it at home and it shows. <laughs> uh, the, um... Oh, it is? Go. Something we've seen already. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to show you one more video because um, I've, yeah, as I said, I've, I've, um, I've become quite interested in the in the materiality of, of, of film. It is a it it kind of chimes with my interest in, in egg tempera. It is it also dates back to you know a long time ago, and it's it it really makes you feel the material when you when you when you have to work with it because there's so much that can go wrong, and it goes wrong not like a not like a digital project that is literally binary so it's, it works it didn't work but it goes wrong slightly so the, the interesting part is to salvage it if because it usually doesn't unless you really know what you're doing uh it usually doesn't come out the way you expected it um so let me show you this Right. So, oh, okay. The um, okay. So, yeah, this is bad. Control plus. I'm not sure if the um, out of focus mess will. Uh, well, okay, fair enough. So, um. One of the things that, that I found interesting about language and image is where it breaks. Um, I've, I've always, my claim has always been that um, art produces nonverbal knowledge. And when I say nonverbal knowledge, I don't mean emotion. I mean that too, probably. But I strongly believe there is, there is sort of, we have a, a sense that, that sort of perceives art in a way that is 
defies verbalization and hence we can't really talk about it. So it's kind of a bit of a catch-22. So, so this sort of questioning of where exactly that blurry border is between image and, and, and language, something I find very interesting. Um, the last piece I want to show you is, so I do, I also collaborate with, with a friend of mine. Uh, oh, that's big now. Let me, oops. Uh, oh, okay. So I collaborate with a friend of mine, Ali Mondera. She is also based in London. She's a Kenyan born, UK based uh, artist. And we've we've shared a, we used to share a studio for for a long long time, and we and we started doing work that kind of would hinge on on our differences, um, but now in the past years I want to say we've really done more projects that kind of critique the the art world, uh, the art industry. By, by just doing things we, we wouldn't do on our own because it's kind of slightly out of the remit of, of what we do. But it's kind of like um, something that we really we really enjoy doing. Uh, it's sort of, how to best describe it? We don't, it's work where we, you know, we don't care. It's sort of, you know, that sort of attitude where, whereby, for example, this, this work is so there's a there's a there's a gallery in London called Lund uh, Mall Galleries, and they are super conservative. So you, you would get shows by the Royal Society of Watercolor Painters, and the Royal Society of Wildlife Painters, and the Royal Society of Oil Painters. So and I said I will never apply that. And then we said, and then a friend of ours uh, said. They are, they are, I'm selecting this year. Do something, I said, we're gonna do something. Uh, so we said, um, what is, what is something, what is something we, we could, what's the kind of piss we could take in, the, in, in, in this case? And, uh, and so in Austria, I suppose in Central Europe, but generally in, in Austria in sp specifically, uh, one of the, one of those icons that you see in in traditional oil painting is the deer, um, and you know you would see it sort of majestic, and it would be you know amazing, and somewhere in the forest, and it would God knows what you know, and uh, it's just you know it's it's supposed to take your breath away. Of course, I couldn't draw a deer to save my life, so I said, let me see if I can get one of those painting by numbers. Uh, and printed off, printed off from from uh, from the internet. So I did, uh, and Arlene said, "Well, what's an icon where I'm from? What about an elephant?" I said, I said "Okay, so let's, let me do an elephant, but I don't want to do the entire elephant." Uh, so she did what she did here in the, in the upper in the upper left corner, and uh, and we sent it there, and uh, because because um, sort of. We were selected by, we sort of were pre-selected, we knew we could do what we wanted because this would have never gone in. Um, so we, so, so they, they had to show this. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we quite enjoy that. So that's the kind of sort of slightly undermining approach we take in, in our common, uh, in our collaboration. All right. So at the moment and for the past year, I've been I've been uh, trying to learn and uh, sort of to get an idea of coding and machine learning because I want to try to apply it in in um, in my films. So the the idea would be to ex to extrapolate the narrative um, or to to create a, a, a short film and then let the artificial intelligence take over and extrapolate the narrative. But I've had to find out that that's pretty much exactly. So for the first time, I'm cutting edge because we can't do that yet. Uh, it took me only I don't know how many decades. Um, so I'm currently trying to figure out where to go with this idea. Um, 
and that, that's 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 something I've I've been sort of trying to work on for the past year. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So, thanks. Questions, complaints, <laughs> feedback. <laughs> Yes, we do have um, actually a question that has come in from one of our online viewers um, who uh, was commenting on some of your earlier pieces. You mentioned your interest in the study of time in terms of your philosophical mm. studies as well. Um, and the question was um, just asking about um, your remarks on speed called to mind Einstein's notion that as speed increases, time slows down. Could you comment, please, on how viewers' subjective experience of time changes during interaction with your work? With that work or with work? Well, it could be in general. I think the question was in reference to the earlier pieces, but it could also apply to more recent work. Hmm. I find that hard to, to, to respond to, to be honest. Um, I would say that the uh, the relativity that Einstein postulates certainly comes up to the degree that um, every person will look at my work in a different way, and depending on how interesting or attracting they would find my work, they would they would find time go by more quickly or more slowly. Um, that's to that degree I can speak to relativity of time with regard to my work. I'm not sure I'm not sure I'm I'm in a situation in terms of my my background to um, comment on, on general or specific relativity as postulated by Einstein beyond beyond that. But um, certainly with some of your time based uh, such as the video projects are just the medium itself is time-based. It seems like some of your t 2D work, of course, is also time-based in terms of the concept. The, the interesting thing was, I remember um, I was talking about egg tempera and it was, and speed, and they two are somewhat conceptually diametrically opposed because because of, of egg tempera being such, a, such an old medium, such a pre-modernist medium, and speed being an, a notion that really has only come up with 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 the industrial revolution uh, properly, and then maybe in art with the um, Italian uh, futurists in the, at the beginning of the twentieth century. So, um, so there is there is that um, with regard to with regard to the um, the sixty millimeter film. Um, it's really, I think the, I think the difference with 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 analog film, or, or analog film and 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 time, they they kind of don't really link up fully. Again, on a conceptual basis, seeing that sixteen mm analog film is really sort of a repetition, not a repetition, sort of just. It's many, many paintings, subsequent paintings, really. So it's a lot of discrete items in a row. Um, time is continuous. But I can't really substantiate that, and maybe it is not. Uh, there is a lot of... I'm, f I'm very interested in, 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 in ideas like relativity and, and quantum physics. But it goes way above my head, um, so that's generally something, generally something that I found that I've, I'm interested in a lot of things that I've just I'm just intelligent enough to realize I find them interesting, and then I get very annoyed that I don't really understand them. So what can you do? It's great to have that spark of inspiration, and of course, for our um, in-person audience, we'll have the chance. Uh, to see some of the work that you've been creating during your time here in Siena, since we have the chance to uh, have a look in the studio, although our online people won't be able to enjoy that period. But uh, for our in-person audience, though, if there's any questions while we're together as a group before we head up to see what's in the studio. Yeah, I, I was having a still. 
which is uh, quite fascinating, but the fact that you use acting uh, yeah. in the sense of like your visual uh, uh, language, you, your, your language, your visual work, it's absolutely contemporary. And uh, I would like to understand, I mean, what uh, attracts you about uh, like what instead of using the painting technique, which is uh, one of the oldest, mm -hmm. and also, which is a technique, which is, I mean, it's not an easy technique. I mean, working with activity. So I'd like to, uh, yeah, to understand, uh, to know more, if you can tell us a little more about uh, why your choice of working with activity and why it fits your visual sure. language. Well, I, one thing that has always fascinated me about Ectempore is because I make it myself, I make it in the studio, every batch is different from the next. So, um, that means, and sometimes it, it goes off, it goes wrongish. It doesn't go wrong. You, it's a bit like analog film. You can salvage it and, and things, usually I say things turn out 75% the way I expect them with that, with egg tempera and 25% is a happy accident. And, um, and that's something that, that has always fascinated me because I, I never quite know how it handles, um, which was the case here as well. Um, it just handled differently than I'd expected. And you then have to sort of run with it and adapt. Uh, and and so, so I suppose the, that not knowing in advance is something that has always fascinated me. And it's also a, it's, it's also, technically speaking, it's also a medium that, that has, um, it dries quite quickly. So it's something that, that when you are, and that, that's, that's a bit of a, that, that's a bit of a, um, a sort of a contradiction to the notion that it's sort of, it's conceptually, historically um, slow, but it dries fast. So you can, you can, you kind of need to know what you're doing to a certain degree. It's not like watercolors, it's not as bad as that, but you kind of need to know you've got one chance and then another one, and then that's that. And then you have to accept what, 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 what you've got. Um, or you, you change everything. Um, and so, so that's why, that's why I, 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 I'm quite fond of it. It's, it's, a, it's the first thing, first, I remember it well, the first day of, of my BA, we learned how to, how to work with egg tempera, which uh, I'd never heard of previously. So. And I've, it's been with me ever since. So. Anyway, I can't wait to go and see your work in person. Oh, God. I hope so. <laughs> well, I think we can uh, maybe wrap up our Q&A for now, but um, we can, of course, continue the conversation with our in-person audience over some refreshments and up in the studio, too. So, but thank you so much, Richard. It's been a pleasure to hear about your work. So, thank My you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.